All right. Well, I think I will go ahead with uh, um, introductions. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds um, today, February the 7th. Um, I'm uh, very excited about this talk today, which is going to expose me to something I have not thought about before. And I think we are very lucky to have the speaker um, that we have uh, on our Emory faculty. So I'm delighted um, to introduce um, Dr. Paul Wolpe who is the Ray Shinazi Distinguished Research Chair of Jewish Bioethics, a professor of medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, neuroscience, and biological behavior and sociology, and the director of the Center for Ethics at Emory. He served for 17 years as the first senior bioethicist for NASA, which I suspect sparked uh, a lot of the um, uh, interest in the topic today, and was the first national bioethics advisor to Planned Parenthood Federation of America. He's editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience, the leading journal in neuroethics, which was a field where he was instrumental in founding it. And he sits on the editorial boards of a, over a dozen professional journals in medicine and ethics. He is the immediate past president of the Association of Bioethics Program Directors, a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, a fellow of the Hastings Center, and a fellow of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, which is the country's oldest medical society. He publishes on sociology, medicine, and ethics, and has contributed to many encyclopedias on ethical and bioethical issues. Dr. Wolpe is trained as a social scientist, which is a little bit rare for an ethicist. His work focuses on the social, religious, ethical, and ideologic impact of medicine and technology on the human condition. So in the past decade, he's shifted his attention um, to the ethics of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. And in fact, that is what I contacted him to um, think about a talk uh, about this and updating us on some of the ethical issues there. When he um, asked if we would be interested in the current talk, which I found so super cool that I was really, really delighted to jump um, on that uh, uh, opportunity. Um, in addition, though, I should mention that he uh, is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences Responsible Science Committee that revised the canonical volume Responsible Science, and he's co-chaired the American Psychological Association's Ethics Commission that examined the APA's ethics procedures in light of its participation in the enhanced interrogation collaboration with the CIA and the DOD. Um, so it should be clear that Dr. Wolpe is a national and international leader in um, ethical issues related to technology and biomedicine. And I, um, I could go on and on about his um, biography, but suffice it to say, I'm, uh, uh, again, uh, very thrilled that he is um, uh, here at Emory and available to us to um, give us this talk today. The subject of today's talk is the bio bioethics in space, clinical and human subjects research challenges at NASA and in commercial space flight. So I think you're going to open our minds to um, a lot of really interesting questions to consider. And we um, look forward to question and answer at the end of his talk. So without further ado, Dr. Wolpe, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thanks so much, Wendy. It's just a delight to be here. I was uh, thrilled that you were interested in hearing about this because as I mentioned before, I don't get to talk about it that often. And it's such an interesting and different and fascinating um, topic. So let me share my screen. Okay, did that work? That looks perfect. Great. All right, so um, I'm gonna tell you the story of how I got involved in this. Uh, it's not uh, something that I pursued, it's something that pursued me. And it's instructive because there's actually a moral at the end of this quick story before I get into the uh, substance of stuff. I will also say that this is going to be a very broad overview because instead of doing a deep dive into one area, I'm going to give you sort of broad overview of three areas. So let me start with my story very quickly. I was um, on vacation with my family in, um, in England, and I got a call that I had it immediately um, call a colleague urgently. And uh, he was a he was the director of the Center for Bioethics at Baylor in Houston. And I was very concerned because an urgent call while I'm on vacation is almost always bad news. So I called him and he I answered the phone and go, well, you know, what's up, uh, Baruch? His name is Baruch. And he said, how would you like to be the bioethicist for NASA? It's kind of like picking up the phone. How would you like to be uh, Prince of Wales? I mean, it just came out of nowhere. I wasn't a NASA guy. I was very interested in science fiction and technology and all that, but I wasn't particularly focused on space. 
And the reason I'm telling you this is to tell you why it was urgent and what happened, because it's a very important story that I tell often just in isolation when I'm teaching issues of research ethics, because what had happened at NASA was um, when a, an astronaut or a cosmonaut does an EVA, which is a spacewalk, extravehicular activity, everything at NASA is an acronym, they must decompress. Um, the uh, pressure in the spacesuit is very different than the pressure in the craft. So like with uh, diving, um, you need to, a decompression protocol. Problem was, and they have a, an actual decompression chamber on um, space station. The problem was it was four hours of decompression, which is a lot of lost astronaut time. And they discovered that there, uh, that there was a port that if you exercised while you were decompressing because of the difference in um, nitrogen oxygen um, uh, ratios and because of the rapid breathing, you could decompress faster. But before they could make that a policy, they had to test it. So they did this study where they were putting people in hyperbaric oxygen chambers and having them run on treadmills and um, testing their oxygen nitrogen exchange and things like that. The problem is that NASA has a company that finds subjects for them. And for this protocol, it was not um, fine. It was not looking for athletes. It was just putting regular people on these treadmills. And the protocol said, of course, what they were, what they were concerned about was decompression um, sickness. So they would tell people, if you feel any pain at all, uh, especially in your joints, you need to tell us immediately. But they put people like me on these things and, if, and they wanted them to run for two hours. So if you put me on a treadmill and asked me to run for two hours, I'd probably get some pain in my ankles and my knees that had nothing to do with decompression sickness. And that's exactly what happened. They started putting people on these treadmills and people would say, raise their hand and say, my knee is starting to hurt. So they take them off. And then the next one, the protocol demanded they stop it immediately. After a dozen or so uh, subjects where they might have gotten one good one, they got together and they said, you know, none of these people had decompression sickness. They, their knees hurt and their ankles hurt because they were running for two hours. And then began the, began the erosion of the protocol. So now the next time they put someone on, they were running after, I don't know, in a half an hour or so, they said, uh, you asked me to report my knee is hurting. And instead of stopping the protocol, they said, what kind of hurting? You say, oh, you know, uh, it happens to me when I run, my, this knee often hurts. And they said, keep going. So you know where this is going. They finally put someone on, started to run, complained of a pain. They asked, what kind of pain? He said, well, you know, I, I hurt this knee once in football, so it often acts up. And then they complained their hip was hurting. By the time they stopped the... Um, with that subject, he had decompression sickness type two neurological. And um, all of a sudden they had a crisis on their hands. So they went back to the chief health and medical office and they said, what are we gonna do? And they discovered that they were so out of compliance with protocols, with filing an MPA, which is what you have to file, what Emory files, what any institution files, basically saying, we promise we will follow uh, regulations. Um, and they hadn't, they hadn't filed one in 10 years, they were completely in crisis. That's what actually um, spurred the call to me to see if there was a bioethicist who could help them out. I was in Philly at the time, uh, their headquarters in Washington, it was a quick train ride. So that's how I became the bioethicist to NASA. I think it's an important story because it shows the importance of sticking to protocols. It made perfect sense for them to begin to erode that protocol, but the process of eroding the protocol um, led them to crisis. And I have a few other stories like that for another time. So that's how I became the bioethicist of NASA. And what I'm going to talk about today is three topics, quickly each, just as an overview, clinical ethics in space, research ethics in space, and what this all means for new, newly emerging commercial space flight. So first, clinical ethics in space. So there are a lot of health threats in space. We take the, um, some of the healthiest people in the world and we put them in environments that make them very sick. 
microgravity uh, is not an environment that the human body was designed for, and neither is extreme isolation over long periods of time. So as we move from just shooting people into space and bringing them right back to long periods on space station, periods of months, and in some cases over a year, uh, that much time in microgravity, that much time in an artificial atmosphere, that much time with food that they, especially at the beginning, found very unpalatable, sleep disturbances led to all kinds of health threats. Um, there's the physical response of the body to the space environment. Let me put the caveat in here. I am not a clinician. I've learned a lot about this stuff, but some of you probably know more about this than I do, but I'm going to try to give you um, what I've seen and learned about that. So the impact of radiation, which I'm going to talk about later, bone loss, muscle loss, um, the problem with exercise, because if you think about exercise, when we even do normal exercise, never walking and standing, it is our body resisting the entire pull of the Earth's gravity. So even if we don't think about it as exercise, we're exercising our whole bodies all the time if we just lift an arm. But when you're, when you're in microgravity, there's no way to exercise all your muscles. I mean, they basically bungee cord themselves down to um, treadmills, but the hundreds of muscles we have can't all be strained in that situation. So there's uh, muscle loss, no matter how much you exercise, bone loss. Uh, there's a lot of stress. Uh, they try to pick very psychologically healthy people, but there have been some real psychological crises in the history of human space flight. Injuries happen all the time in, in microgravity. I mean, things float around, things have momentum. Um, the eyes are very vulnerable. They're supposed to wear eye protection at all times, but they don't, they don't find it comfortable. Uh, bungee cords snap, um, heavy things get a slight push and just keep going and hit someone else. So there's a lot of injuries on space station. There's always the possibility of the failure of some life support system, whether it's the HVAC system, whether it's the oxygen system that uh, actually caught on fire in one case. Uh, so the environment can cause all kinds of problems, especially at the beginning before they started making better food. Uh, they had trouble with food. People didn't want to eat it. It's very difficult to sleep in, zero, in microgravity. If you think about how you fall asleep, you nestle in. Gravity helps you sleep by giving you that feeling of being sort of um, cocooned into some space. When you have no gravity, you're floating even on your bed and you also have to strap yourself down to the bed. So that sensation of resting and coming to some kind of a, a place where you can sleep is very difficult. Uh, and that's the picture, by the way, is uh, one of the astronauts in their sleep cell. There are biohazards in the craft environment. There are toxins that are supposed to be um, well controlled, but leak sometimes. And then there's just the normal development of disease, often um, facilitated by the kind of environment that you're in. We will talk in a minute about the other stressor, which is response to Earth-based events, which has caused sometimes um, other kinds of psychological stress. So these and many other things mean that there's a constant health need in space. And now we're primarily talking about um, long duration space flight. When I got there, we were on space station. We were doing a lot of that work, but uh, President Bush at one point said that we were gonna go to the moon and Mars, never happened, but he told NASA to begin to plan for we, what we call long duration space flight beyond LEO. LEO is low earth orbit. The International Space Station is in low earth orbit, only about 240, 250 miles above the surface of the earth. And we're now talking about what are called exploration class missions to the moon and Mars. Uh, just for those of you who don't really get the scale of this, Space starts about 60 miles from the surface of the Earth. The International Space Station, as I say, uh, orbits 240, 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. The moon is 240 to 250,000 miles away. So it's a thousand times further away than the space station. And uh, Mars can be about 11 million miles away. So, you have enormous difference in scale that really um, 
means a very different kind of medicine on space station than on exploration class missions, as we'll see. So the first thing you have to think about when you think about going to the moon or Mars is how do you equip a craft for medical care? Uh, what medical resources do you provide and not provide? Every ounce you put on a craft is ounce you have to take off somewhere else. Because, um, what kinds of um, equipment do you think of as, as providing life support versus what kind um, do you think of as, as explicit both preventive and uh, clinical medical care? What's the impact of disease of various kinds on the individual and on the crew when you think about how you're gonna equip the craft? Um, what would be the impact on the mission if a person got a particular kind of injury or disease? How do you think about equipping the craft with medical uh, equipment? Again, always thinking about weight or up mass as they call it, as you'll see. For prevention versus treatment immediate versus future needs. Now we're talking about a three-year mission to Mars. What kind of a medical equipment should be on there, thinking not only of sort of maintenance of health, but the entire spectrum of possible things that could go wrong, diseases and injuries. Uh, and what about the fact that, you're, that we have had international crews that had very different views of medicine and medical care, that had religious and cultural and um, social needs that differed uh, and we have to accommodate them all and think about them ahead of time, depending on which crew was going to um, staff a particular mission. And then there's the question of who should control allocation of the formulary. I mean, after all, you're going to have a limited number of drugs on board. Um, certainly anybody who has a headache should be able to grab an aspirin. But when you start talking about more sophisticated drugs, are you going to limit their allocation to the physician on board? What right will the crew have to self-medicate? These are all decisions you have to uh, decide ahead of time. And you're restrained by your environment for resources. Uh, as I said, weight or up mass, again, NASA won't use a regular word if they can think, it's kind of like medicine. Uh, NASA won't use a regular word if they can think of a jargonistic word. So weight becomes up mass. There's only a certain amount of weight that the um, craft can handle. So you always have to think in terms of, of trading, of trading in and out. And that includes volume. Um, it's not just mass that's limited, it's volume, it's actual space on the craft. So you also have to think about the volume of the equipment that you wanna put on board. Power needs. Um, the craft only has a finite amount of power that it can generate. So you can't put equipment onto a craft that's going to draw too much power in its use. Uh, diagnostic equipment, for example. How much clean water and other hygienic needs do you have to run this equipment? There may need to be surgery on board. How are we gonna think about surgery in a three-year mission uh, in terms of the liquids that might be needed, whether it's you know blood products or whether it's just clean water, um, how we're gonna sterilize equipment. As I'll show you in a minute, it's, it, is not, it has happened in the past that the physician was the one who got sick. And in some cases, the physician might be unable to provide the care. So if you're talking about five, six, eight people, however many end up going on our first mission to Mars or a mission to the moon, where turning around and coming back quickly may not be an option, you're gonna need redundancy. You're going to need at least a couple of people who can do um, healthcare on board. If I have a choice of putting one drug in a formulary that um, addresses four symptoms or, or disease um, needs adequ uh, re uh, adequately, or four separate drugs that address them really well, I might choose the one less good drug because it means that one drug instead of four drugs that I'm putting on, and that includes diagnostic equipment and treatment equipment. I might put on equipment that isn't as good. It isn't standard of care because the, the volume of it, the weight of it um, might make me compromise and say, this is good enough because the what's really good, we can't afford to put on the craft. It's too heavy. 
um, it was too complicated, whatever the, it takes too much power, whatever the needs might be. We not only need surgical capabilities, we need dental capabilities, optical uh, problems, ophthalmological problems, gynecological problems, perhaps it, you know, the entire spectrum of medical care needs to be um, represented on that craft within the range of what might go wrong reasonably. And I'll talk about that also. And what kind of imaging technology might we put on the craft? You know, what an ultrasound perhaps might be more space and weight efficient than an X-ray uh, facility. So you need to think about how you're gonna equip the craft in that way too. And part of that decision, and by the way, I think of all of those decisions as having ethical elements. I think all those kinds of decisions have an ethical component to them. But when we think about it, we think about it on three dimensions at NASA. What is the likelihood of occurrence or the likelihood of use of a piece of equipment or the likelihood of need of a drug? So we try to come up with some in a three-year mission to Mars, what's the likelihood that any particular kind of injury or disease might happen that would require the use of this particular thing that we're thinking of uh, putting on, the, on board? Then if it does happen, how severe will it be? How will it disable a crew member? Will it just be painful? Is it easily managed? Um, how should we think about it in terms of its severity? And then finally, how effective are the countermeasures that we are able to put on the craft? Just uh, First of all, can we prevent it? And what is the cost of preventing it in terms of weight and um, volume and things like that? Will it just ameliorate symptoms? Will it cure? And if you think of these as kind of scales where you can move up and down the likelihood, if all three were equal, um, then you, you know, it would be easy to make that decision. And if all three moved up and down together, then perhaps the decision-making would be much easier. But what about you know, um, something that has a fairly low likelihood of actually happening? But if it did happen, the um, severity of it, the impact on the uh, astronauts and the mission would be severe, but our ability given the constraints of the craft to actually mitigate it or prevent it are middling to low. And if you move each of these differently for different things, you see the complexity of trying to decide how we would actually equip a craft. People get sick and hurt and injured in space all the time. This is a very, um, truncated list. It doesn't come close to covering uh, all of the kinds of injuries and problems people have had in space. And, um, you know, we're not going to go over them. But you not only have injuries and disease, but you have the sort of normal problems of microgravity, uh, physiological, <laughs> excuse me, changes, exposure to uh, microgravity, uh, the physiological changes from exposure to microgravity include endocrine and metabolic metabolic changes. There are all kinds of vestibular and orthostatic uh, problems with people, especially, by the way, when they return to Earth, musculoskeletal changes, all the psychosocial pressures of isolation and confinement, the long-term impact of radiation exposure. Um, the people who work on it uh, uh, and uh, analogize it to aging. Um, it's the same kind of stress on the body over time, uh, condensed into a very short period of time. And even though we test astronauts for you know, physiological health, they still have pre-existing conditions or susceptibilities sometimes that we know nothing about that can be exacerbated in the space environment. The analogy, the, the, the uh, test case that we use, as some of you I'm sure know, is Antarctica. Um, because Antarctic stations are more isolated than space station, not more isolated than the moon or Mars. But during winter, you can't get to the Antarctica space station. People have to winter in place. And so NASA has studied Antarctica for years and years to look at the impact of isolation, at psychodynamics of small groups trapped with each other, what happens when there is disease, and there have been a number of examples of that. The most famous is uh, Jerry Nelson in 1998, who was the physician 
um, the only physician at the South Pole Research Station, I, there were 40 people there. When she found a lump, diagnosed her own breast cancer, well, diagnosed at first, she just saw, felt the lump and she let it go because she, winter had just started and she knew there was no chance for an evacuation for months. So she found it in May. By June, it had grown and she realized that she was gonna have to biopsy. So she biopsied it herself. She trained her staff, including her engineers and others to help her with this biopsy. One of the engineers jury rigged a fiber optic cable into a microscope that they happened to have um, so that they could send an image of the uh, tissue back to Houston to have physicians look at it. Um, to make a long story short, it was a remarkable uh, story uh, worth reading about. It turned out she did have uh, breast cancer. And so they made a very unusual midwinter drop. A plane can't land there in midwinter, but it can fly over at high altitude and drop. Uh, so dropped chemotherapy um, uh, equipment uh, and drugs down to her and she treated herself until she could finally be um, uh, evacuated. Uh, she uh, ended up di dying at 57 of related problems, but she was in remission uh, for a long time. And then, you know, another similar example is Ronald uh, Shemensky, who was also at the South Pole, and he suffered a gallbladder attack and then developed a severe pancreatitis. So they really had to evacuate him also. But what all of that taught us is these things can happen in, in even highly um, screened individuals who are thought to be health, healthy. Um, there are also extreme, as I say, psychiatric and psychological issues uh, in a um, case within the Russian space station, a man attacked the other, two, there were only three of them there wintering over and a man attacked the other two with an ax and believe it or not, they had to strap him to a chair for three months. They fed him, they took care of him, but they were scared to let him go. So that, you know, are we going to equip a long duration craft with a straight jacket? You know, those are the kinds of questions that you really have to ask and answer ahead of time. Severe injury, Imagine now that we're on our way to Mars and someone has a traumatic brain injury. Well, that not only takes out that crew member, but it also in a sense takes out one other crew member who has to care for this person. So what do we do? Do we say, you know, thank you for your service and send them out the, uh, the shoot <laughs> to deep space? Do we bring a staff member, a second crew member to take care of this person, pulling two out of our six crew members off of duties that are needed to, to maintain the craft and, and jeopardize the whole crew and jeopardize the mission. Very problematic questions that have to be decided ahead of time. Um, and then the crisis, like the example of uh, the one I gave you in with the Russians. And then there's the question of what happens if someone dies in space or dies on the surface of Mars. Do we leave them there? Do we put them in a body bag for, you know, a month, you know, a, a month, six months, a year, a year and a half till we can get them back home? Do we say thank you for your service and give them a space burial, like a burial at sea? None of these questions have been decided definitively yet, but before we can do what are called exploration class missions, we do need to make these, these kinds of decisions. And then there's medical information management that is different in space. What happens when, um, a crew member discovers some problem. What would happen if Jerry Nelson was on the Mars mission and discovered the breast lump? Now, the way it works on space station is you have a private one-to-one -one restricted conversation with physicians. That is your conversation about your own health is um, privileged. But what happens when someone becomes sick? What happens when they need resources from the mission, what should be told and shouldn't be told to the rest of the crew, um, what should and shouldn't be told to their family. So downloading information, um, what should be private and not private becomes an issue. But the other issue is that astronauts tend not to tell their 
uh, ground-based uh, medical crew when they get sick, when they get hurt. They're always worried that it'll mean the end of the mission. And by the way, it's even worse when they're getting their physicals before they go on a mission. They know, as at this point, I'm trained to go on this mission. I'm scheduled to go on this mission. The only thing that can stop me is some bad medical issue. So they close down and they, as much as they get encouraged, this is a constant struggle. Uh, and it's why astronauts don't like doctors because doctors are often the only thing that stand between them and a mission, even though the uh, physicians who work for NASA want nothing more than to get these astronauts onto their mission. Another interesting issue is that telemedicine involves delay. If you look at how long it takes information to go between a planet like Mars, for example, I think you can see my cursor there. So um, between the Earth and Mars, uh, depending on where each are in their orbit, their times are further away and closer together, can be from four to 22 minutes in each direction. So if you need to ask a question from the craft to a physician, it could be 20 minutes getting to Houston, then they have to think of the answer, and then 20 minutes back, 40 minutes delay in an emergent situation may be too much. That's why you need expertise on board and sometimes redundant expertise on board. And certainly now with, with sophisticated computers, you can put a lot of medical information on board. Um, so you would upload all medical information and have it available on board and have it, someone trained on board to be able to access it. Um, but you still have these questions about what information is disclosed to the whole crew and what information isn't. And that may be an emergent issue or it may be that the, um, at least the principles of it are decided ahead of time as it should be. And then there's uploaded information, information going in the other direction. What happens if you're on your way to Mars, you're gone for three years and a family member is killed or uh, a loved one is diagnosed with cancer? Um, should we tell them? This is an ongoing conversation. What kind of information should we or shouldn't we give and it's not just the family. What if you know they're on their way to Mars when the Twin Towers were hit or when the pandemic starts? Is it just a need to know basis or do they have a right to know certain kinds of information? And by the way, um, even though we're worried about what the impact is, does the astronauts and cosmonauts themselves always say they want to know? So we need to decide exactly what kind of information we will and won't give. Um, another, la the last example on clinical issues I want to say before I move to research, there were a lot of clinical issues that got discussed that were really um, uh, emergent at, at the time, um, questions of who would be allowed to fly, uh, what was acceptable radiation exposure on just ISS missions. But when it comes to long duration space flight, these questions become a lot more trenchant. So OCHMO is the um, office of the chief health and medical officer. That's the office I worked in, the OCHMO office. Um, and the office asks the Institute of Medicine to uh, think about and give them some advice on the question of, um, we have, for example, OSHA standards on how much radiation a human body is allowed to have as part of its occupational exposure. Well, astronauts um, are under the OSHA lifetime exposure, but they're exempted from the daily exposure because daily exposure in space exceeds what OSHA allows as the daily radiation exposure on Earth. But if we're now talking about long duration flights, there are a bunch of standards that we use on Earth that will no longer be able to be applied or else we can't go to Mars. So the OCHMO office asked uh, the IOM to think about that and to ask the question, how should we think about standards? Uh, and to, re to, to issue a report on policies and the ethical questions and answers relevant for crew standards. And so I was very involved in, uh, in testifying to the IOM on these issues as a, as a representative of NASA. Um, and the big issue was radiation exposure, lifetime radiation exposure. I could give the whole talk today on that fascinating issue. Uh, radiation exposure was um, 
uh, limited to the amount of, of radiation that in the best um, estimation of experts would increase an individual's lifetime risk of cancer by 3%. 3% is an arbitrary standard. Uh, there's no reason it can't be 4% or 2%. Um, there's nothing magical about 3%. So if we say for astronauts on long duration missions, we can make it 4%, um, it's not violating some um, standard that has an empirical reality. It's violating some standard that was a compromised, um, a compromised standard of com committees who thought 3% sounded about right. Uh, and so there's a lot to say about that, but the thought of, you know, do we, and do we make an exception to the standard for particular missions, or do we change the standard for astronauts? Whether you think of it as an exception or whether you think of it as a change standard actually has a lot of repercussions, a lot of implications for how you apply standards and how you exempt people from standards and how you give people waivers if they even have to go over the standards we've set. So these are that's another example of how we um, try to come to some decisions that have clinical implications or at least health implications down the line. And so we tried to come up with some ethical principles to guide moral dis medical decision-making um, first before uh, we initiate the mission to have these standards uh, across the board to define our goals clearly of how we're going to maintain health, to balance our priorities between individual uh, health and safety and mission success. I once ran a meeting with a whole bunch of engineers about astronaut health, and I opened the meeting and I said, look, if I have it, you know, raise your hand, don't wait till the end of my talk if you have anything to say. My first sentence out of my mouth at that meeting was, I think we can all agree that the health and the safety of the crew is an absolute priority. Hand goes up immediately. Yes, the engineer says, I don't think that's necessarily true. If you're halfway to Mars and we find uh, you know, a symptom of a disease or, or you know, a breast lump as with uh, Dr. Nelson, or we find something, he says, if what you're saying is true, no question, no debate, turn around and come back. He goes, I don't actually think that's what we'll do. We've just spent billions of dollars on our first mission to Mars. It's going to take a lot to turn that craft around. So I don't think we can think of the health and safety of the crew as an absolute standard. And he was completely right. But that's where the conversation needs to start. Um, acceptable levels of risk have to be defined. Um, and it's important to do the research ahead of time to know as much as we can know so that we, we do send people there as safe as possible. And, and what are the long-term effects that we will allow? All right, so that's clinical. Uh, I'm gonna be much quicker about research and commercial stuff. I'm just gonna tease you with those things uh, because there's so much rich clinical question. The research questions are, are really more concentrated into a two or three questions because they also include all the clinical issues uh, especially in clinical research. The first that really NASA had a hard time was, was defining what was research. Everything that happens on a craft is new and is in some sense experimental. And everything is collected for analysis. So drawing those lines between research, which is sort of this grouped um, systematic way of testing things to make general conclusion and quality assurance issues on the craft and um, uh, uh, you know, just the fact that uh, metabolism is different in microgravity. So just taking a drug that you would take on earth is going to metabolize differently. And so that's an experiment every time you do it. This was, all, this was an ongoing conversation and may still be to this day uh, in people involved in spaceflight. When we sit on an IRB, what we're supposed to do when someone brings us a protocol is weigh the risks and benefits of that protocol. That is the first responsibility of an IRB. And if you bring me a new drug for um, you know, MS and I'm sitting on the IRB, I immediately know in my mind what the benefit is. 
uh, mitigation of symptoms, perhaps cure of MS. Um, I've got the benefit firmly in my mind when I look at the risks of the trial for this new drug. But I went to the IRB, uh, NASA has a bunch of IRBs, but when I went to the Johnson Space Center IRB, the biggest and most involved IRB, and I said, when you look at um, benefit, what do you think about? I realized that they hadn't ever talked about it and they had very different ideas about who benefits from a medical trial because the individual subjects and astronauts might benefit. They're gonna use these things later on. Oops, sorry, press that too quickly. Um, but it also benefits the astronauts as a whole. So maybe that's what the IRB should be thinking about or the space program more broadly. How are we ever gonna to get to Mars if we don't do this? And there are people at NASA who I think of as sort of the space evangelists who say we must do this because when the astronaut someday hits Earth and wipes out life on this planet, if we haven't colonized other planets, it's the end of the species. And so is this risk worth taking to save the species? So those are the kinds of questions that um, people ask. When you look at an astronaut as a research subject, they are a research subject under the common rule. That is, they're like any research subject here on earth, which means, uh, and, and so here's the common rule. These are all the regulatory agencies that must abide by um, this rule that we call 45 CFR 46 in the biz. And notice here is NASA. It is a signatory to the common rule. So everybody who works for NASA, including astronauts, must have the same, um, rights as any research subject, which means that they, they have, as the law tells us, the right to refuse to participate or discontinue participation at any time without penalty. Well, when you have an N of three for your um, uh, research because you're using people up on space station, one withdrawal knocks out 33% of your um, subjects. So what do we do about the fact that uh, astronauts have this right to withdraw or refuse to participate at any time and without penalty. What counts as a penalty? There were some missions on uh, the shuttle, for example, that were just physiology research missions. That is, everybody on board was on board and, and orbited the Earth a number of times in order to do physiological studies. And what if I was scheduled to go on that mission, which is all astronauts want to do. They want to go on missions and you had 15 studies you wanted me to uh, participate in, and I said, no, I won't do any of them. Then the question is, is it a penalty to say to me, okay, we're taking you off of this mission. We'll put you on a future mission that isn't a research, a physiology research mission, and we'll bring an astronaut in who's willing to do these. Is that an acceptable or unacceptable action? So what counts as a penalty and to what are astronauts entitled such that taking that away is a violation of the common rule. The astronauts, not surprisingly, the astronauts and the uh, health office disagreed on the interpretation of those two words. And the second big research issue, and by the way, the chief scientist when I first started said, if you can solve these two problems, the problem of withdrawing at any time and the second problem of confidentiality, then as far as I'm concerned, take a salary for the rest of your life because they're driving us crazy. The second problem is confidentiality. If you have an N of three and you gather any physiological data and one is a you know six foot two male and the other is a five foot seven female and you know one is white and one is black and one weighs 20 pounds more than any data you gather and everybody knows who's on every flight and which scientific protocols are on that flight, which means there's no confidentiality at all if you give out demographic data, which led astronauts to refuse to allow the office to release any dem demographic data, which they used as a kind of um, a uh, bargaining chip to get things that they wanted. So that was also a very big issue and um, if I did anything at NASA in my 15 years or so there, if I had any great accomplishment, it was that when I talked to astronauts about this, they all said the same sort of party line, which is, 
Well, what if they find something up there and it ends up being a pre-existing condition and then when I leave NASA and I try to get insurance, I can't get insurance. And I went back to the chief health and medical officer. I said, does NASA not give its astronauts lifetime insurance? And it turns out that when astronauts left NASA, they lost their NASA insurance. Now, most of them went on to be CEOs of companies, but this was the line they were using. So I said, you know, there's 700 astronauts in a multi-billion dollar agency, give them lifetime insurance. And that way you're taking away one of the major, you know, reasons that they say that they want confidentiality. And in fact, that's what they did. They gave them uh, lifetime insurance. And the other complaint was, um, we're not involved in deciding the research. So another thing that I helped with was getting astronauts on the scientific uh, peer review merit committees, as well as the IRB to make sure that they had a voice in all of this. Um, so the final thing I'll leave you, so, but before that happened, they um, commissioned this uh, report, Safe Passage, and what Safe Passage decided was, well, if we can't get astronauts to do this, we're just gonna force them to do it. I know they're supposed to be part of the common rule, but since they're the only ones that can give us this information, um, maybe sort of this volunteer um, model doesn't work. Well, people with you know, a particular disease may be the only one who can give us information about the response um, of a person with that disease to a drug, but we don't take away their rights. So there was a lot of negotiation that went on there too. And in the end, they didn't, uh, change the nature of the common rule. Instead, they just involved astronauts more in the decision-making and astronauts were much happier to participate in non-participation, which was very low to begin with, went way down. So that's just some of the research issues. And then finally, a few weeks ago, I was up in Cold Spring Harbor at Banbury uh, with a group of other ethicists and NASA people and commercial space people to say, how do we translate all of these things that happened at NASA, which is a governmental agency, to commercial space flight. And commercial space flight, um, as you all know, there's been massive amounts of money and technology put into it. There's an estimate that over the next decade, there could be as many as 60,000 people going into space over the next decade or two decades. Um, there is a plan right now to transition the International Space Station to private hands by 2030. Whether that'll happen or not, we don't know. Um, government contracts are being given to private industry now to develop low earth orbit destinations. NASA is giving up a lot of these um, things that they feel private industry can handle while still working on the big long distance projects that they think NASA is better suited to do. Um, the FAA has had a mandatory moratorium on regulations uh, for spaceflight participant safety on commercial vehicles. Um, and that sunsets in October of this year. Um, and in the meantime, the FAA is encouraging the industry to develop standards, to revising the government's recommended practices on occupant safety, to establishing a uh, committee to garner industry input. So a lot of activity is happening to turn to the question of what we're gonna allow commercial space flight to do, and especially how are we gonna do research on um, commercial space flight when it's different than government-run, astronaut-trained um, space flight. Uh, first of all, who's going to go on commercial space flights? It's not going to be a group of fit, trained um, astronauts. It's going to be people from private industry. It's going to be people from the space flight company, that is the pilot and the crew. It could be people from government. It could be people from military. It could be people who are 21. It could be people who are 91. How are we gonna think of them as research subjects and will there be differences depending on their age, their, um, you know, what, where they come from, where they come from government, from private industry, and are private companies gonna be allowed to sidestep the common rule um, in order to do research and what kind of research are they gonna do? So how are they gonna um, standardize subjects? How are they going to think about controls? What is informed consent gonna look like? Um, if I, do I have a, uh, can the private company say to me, I'm sorry, you don't get to fly unless you're willing to give us a blood sample at the end. 
because they may not be bound by the common rule if they're not getting federal money. Now, all of them get federal money now, but that doesn't mean they always will. And what is, does that, is that coercion and something that we don't want to uh, allow? Who's going to make the scientific review decisions of what kind of research is appropriate and inappropriate and good and bad for commercial space flight? Who's going to decide what IRBs decide, risk, benefit, and proportionality? I mean, any smart spaceflight company will have an ethics review committee, but they don't have to. And then finally, representation, especially of developing countries who don't have the resources, who don't have a space agency. Are we going to try to create a more inclusive um, commercial space enterprise where it isn't just going to be a rush and a grab for resources? We're not going to start carving up the moon and carving up Mars. Um, but rather one more like Antarctica, where we try to create treaties and, and, and um, apportion things in a more equitable way. When we don't think about these things, people die. This is the crew of uh, SCS-107 that broke up over Texas and Louisiana. I met this crew. I was at the launch. Um, uh, people knew these people personally. These deaths are, are really, really tragic. And it's what happens when you don't think through both the medicine, the safety, as well as the ethical principles on which you're going to build the space enterprise. Uh, these are the people I'd like to acknowledge at NASA who taught me everything, the little that I know that I've tried to impart to you. And thanks for your attention. Thanks so much. Um, that's it, again uh, opened my eyes. No idea or had no not thought about so many of these um, challenges before. Um, uh, people feel free to put um, uh, questions in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, I think uh, uh, Jose Chacon, you know, uh, recalled when John Glenn became the oldest person in space and and uh, uh, on a NASA mission, but then uh, thinking also about William Shatner recently and so right. on. How does you know how does age? How do you think about age with with this? And again, is it just informed consent, or are yeah. there other principles to consider? So you know, part of it depends on. We have learned that that um, amount of time you spend in space makes a big difference. So the kind of space flight that William Shatner went on really isn't any kind of a long duration space flight. It's, it's what I call the I touched it flight. So you fly up 60, 65, 70 miles, you get weightless for a few minutes, you've kind of I touched it and then you come back down. I don't really, it, it's, it's, it's a very sophisticated, very expensive amusement park ride. Um, uh, so I don't really have that much problem with with people, even old older people uh, doing that. Uh, John Glenn's trip on the other hand was a real uh, trip and he seemed to do fine. I don't think we know enough about it yet. And so it's going to be a question of how much caution is the right amount of caution for this. Uh, and people can differ on that. Uh, up until now, with the exception of John Glenn, you know, NASA has been pretty careful about who's gone up, very careful. It's a very scarce resource. When the resource becomes common, if it ever really becomes common, um, then I think these questions are going to be really important ones. And it's not just age, it's infirmity, it's disability. Um, we're going to have to have serious conversations about what the implications are of all different kinds of populations. The you know so the commercial enterprise right now, which is you know um, you know Jeff Bezos and so on and Elon Musk, it it seems like it's such a slippery slope because as you said right now it's really a very expensive amusement park ride, right. but you know then they'll go ten miles further and then fifteen miles further. I mean it seems like it very incrementally could be a slippery slope, yeah. um, and, and, you know, and I. I guess I really question how much people are thinking about ethics um, as this slope is slippery. Do you, do you have any comments there? So at this Banbury conference, I mean, it was about research in commercial space flight. That's what the topic was. But we had people from industry there who make these decisions. They're kind of the closest thing to ethicists that these commercial space flight companies have. And they're very worried about it because, you know, one disaster could destroy your whole you know, think about it as a as a business person. Um, 
you don't want someone to die in space. You don't want someone to get injured in space. You don't want someone to, who went up to space healthy to come back impaired. So they are very concerned about these kinds of things. They're also concerned about public attitudes towards them. People are scared of space and they, they don't want people to do it uh, frivolously. So the good news is that um, unlike other kinds of enterprises, there is very good business reasons to be cautious about all these kinds of things. And that I think is our saving grace. The problem is like in all things, you're cautious at the beginning and then you, it becomes a bit, you know, you get habituated to it and it doesn't seem like a problem anymore. By the way, that's why the um, uh, Columbia uh, exploded because what exploded the shuttle Columbia was ice strikes, which had at the very beginning, engineers were very, very worried about it. And then after a hundred shuttle flights where ice broke off on almost every flight, it seemed like, okay, well, maybe it isn't the problem we thought it was. And then with Columbia, it broke off and hit the leading edge of the wing and broke through. And then on return, uh, plasma got in there and blew and destroyed the craft. So, you know, the issue of habituation is, is actually itself an interesting and problematic ethical uh, issue. And that was actually the point you made with your very first case, right? With the right. knee pain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is a little frightening to me to think that um, the cushion for ethical thought or for protecting people is a business plan instead of grounded in ethical thought. But, uh, um, but we are at the top of our hour. Um, I want to thank you so much for um, for telling us these stories and 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 uh, and and letting us think about really what you know. I again had no no idea of the amount of the different considerations, the amount of thought, the number of you know events that have happened, the way that you have to think about how you um, support flights and so on and so forth. So thanks so much. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity. I love talking about this stuff, and I don't get a lot of opportunities to do it. Well, great. All right, to everybody else, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.